Let's pray one more time. Heavenly Father, we just come to you tonight. I thank you and I praise you for your word. God, we love your word. We thank you for your word. It is alive. It is full of power. And God, I just thank you that we have the freedom to come in here and gather together in the name of Jesus. Now, Lord, I ask you, please let the mantle of teacher come and rest on me. Lord, enable to be accurate, enable me to be clear with what it is that you've put on my heart for tonight. I love this message, Lord. And I just ask you, God, that my love for this word and this message will be conveyed by your spirit to all those within the sound of my voice. Lord, I just thank you and praise you for this night. And we give you all the glory and the honor and the praise in Jesus' name. Can you say amen? So we are in this wonderful series, The Bountiful Blessings of God, and uh, I hope you have notebooks with you to take some notes. If you don't, just turn over the announcement sheet and you can take some notes there. And um, so what we're going to do tonight, um, I, I really want to get through the teaching that God has put on my heart for this night. So rather than reading Psalm 103 all the way through again, and I'm just hoping and really asking you that at least one time during the week that you would read Psalm 103 all the way through, at least one time during the week, because these are the bountiful benefits of God that he has. That, real, that definition means the acts of good that God does for the, the blessings, the benefits that he pours out on us for his covenant believing people who obey him. These benefits, these blessings literally come as a reward. And oftentimes our minds would say to us, well, how then could I ever qualify? However, could I be good enough or saintly enough or holy enough to qualify for these benefits? And I love how Psalm 103 is arranged because that question is answered first of all. Psalm 103, David wrote this um, and I, it begins in verse one, praise the Lord, O my soul. Now just a reminder, your soul is your mind, your will, which is your choice making ability, and your emotions, your mind, your will, and your emotions. And David says, praise the Lord, O my soul, and all my inmost being, so spirit, soul, everything, praise his holy name, praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Very first lesson that we did on this was forget not, the importance of remembering. And I love how this is worded because David is talking to himself. You know, I was hearing one of the gals over here giving a praise report about praying out loud, praying out loud. Jeremiah 1.12 says he watches over his word to perform it. He watches over his word to perform it. It is important to pray out loud, to use your voice. And I love what David is doing here because he's talking to himself and he's saying, mind, <laughs> choice making, emotions, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna get in line here and we're gonna praise God, amen? Now that's a good way to talk to yourself, right? Because when, when we're gonna talk tonight about a particular time when you really do need to talk to yourself. But he's saying, praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Verse two, praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And here is how we qualify. Verse three, the God who forgives, present tense, all your sins. We did a whole week on that. It's amazing, isn't it? Everything, everything, he forgives all our sins. The things we should have done, and we didn't, the things we did do that we shouldn't have done, right? The, 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 the sins of, that we commit, the things that we omit, the 
Romans 14.23, everything that doesn't come from faith is sin. Romans 14.23, if we come to him with true repentance, we are washed clean. Amen? 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 Are you awake out there? Amen? We are washed clean by the blood of the lamb, which means we qualify. We qualify. The first benefit is so stunning, it makes our heads spin. He forgives all our sins. And then there's an and there, which is so important, because everything done to forgive our sins was done at the cross. Amen? And the next word is and heals all your diseases. Everything done for our healing was also done at the cross. And when Jesus said, it's finished, that's exactly what he meant. It is finished. Does that mean we'll never have to fight? <laughs> no. In fact, we are told to fight the good fight of faith. Amen? It's often a fight. We're, we still live in this fallen world. And Satan is still a mean devil who comes to steal and kill and destroy. Amen? But Jesus said, I have come that you would have life and have it to the full. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. And here we are, verse 4 tonight. Who redeems, and you see, every one of these verbs is in present tense. Do you see this? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. So, what, so he, he forgives, he heals, and now we're reading who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Wow, those are some mighty wonderful benefits. So let's talk a little bit about this, all right? And reminding you, when was it done? This was done at Calvary. Amen? It was done at Calvary. The word redeems. It's the Hebrew word that is spelled G-A-A-L. It's pronounced ga'al. G-A-A-L, redeems. And according to Oriental law, law at the time that this was written, it's a law, a, a redeemer was a law of kinship. Someone who performed the part of the next of kin. For those of you who are familiar with the book of Ruth in the Old Testament, you're familiar with this principle that you see actually lived out there when you read that beautiful book of Ruth. Naomi, who had come from Bethlehem and gone with her husband because of a, a horrible famine, they had left Bethlehem and they had gone to Moab, to the Moabites, to a, a, a land that was not their own, to a people who did not worship their God. And while there, their sons, two of their sons, married Moabite women. And Naomi finds herself in a place where her husband dies and both of her sons die. So there is no one left to care for her in Moab. And she makes the decision that she's going to go back to Bethlehem. And there's a beautiful passage there where one daughter, Orpah, she decides that she is going to stay in Moab, but it's Ruth who says to her, where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. It's often quoted in marriage ceremonies, but it was a woman who was declaring, I'm leaving my old life. I'm leaving this life that has not worked, and I am going with hope towards something different. Can you say amen? Amen. She had to step out. She'd never been to Bethlehem. Her husband had died. She's a widow too, a young widow, but she says to her mother-in-law, I'm coming with you. I am coming with you. And it's, it's beautiful because when they get to Bethlehem, those of you who know the story, Naomi sent Ruth to Boaz because 
And it, it's kind of implied there that Boaz was this rich, good-looking man, but he was also their relative. He was their relative and qualified as a kinsman redeemer, a kinsman redeemer. And for those of you who know the story, he was enamored by Ruth. He fell in love with Ruth. He married Ruth, and they are in the lineage of Jesus. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. But he stepped into that place of being a kinsman redeemer. Now listen, write these words down, because you have a redeemer. We say he redeems our lives, amen? He is the God of our redemption. What does it mean? Uh, in the Old Testament is uh, uh, redeeming is avenging. It means to bring family honor. It means protecting. It means bringing provision. And it means even revenging, avenging and revenging, the role of a redeemer. Now just think about this. Part of what a redeemer would do is buy back a relative's property. Like, you know, how many of you have taken things from your life and you have literally traded them in at the pawn shop of hell? I mean, literally. You just traded them in, right? And Jesus, when he comes, takes that ticket, amen? He takes that ticket and he gets it all back, amen? He brings it back and the ticket is torn up for always and forever, amen? Not only does he buy back those things that we have sold in that pawn shop of hell, but he buys back our birthright. We become new creatures in Christ Jesus, amen? We become heirs of salvation, co-heirs with Christ Jesus. Everything, you know, when people talk to me about being alcoholic, I will meet them like wherever they are. Okay, if they're willing to take even step one toward getting any help, I'll just meet them there. So usually their approach is one of two things, right? First is alcoholism is a disease. Okay, what does Psalm 103 verse three say? Yeah, all our diseases, right? He forgives all our sins and heals all our diseases. Oh, well, 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 really it's inherited. It's inheritance, okay? And my response to that is, well, praise God, you have a new inheritance in Christ Jesus. Amen? Old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. Amen? Amen. It's that uh, mindset. Amen? That mindset. He buys back our birthright. And um, he, um, the kinsman redeemer would, would marry the widow of a relative. You do know Jesus Christ is your bridegroom, amen? And that you are the bride of Christ. And Isaiah 54 verse five says, your maker is your husband, amen? I mean, that is the verse that you must hold on to. Those of you who no longer have your husbands with you, you know, mine is, has preceded me to heaven. But my maker is my husband here, amen? Those of you who might be married but not living with your husband, your maker is your husband. Those of you who are married and you're living with your husband but he's rotten, <laughs> your maker is your husband, amen? And you just keep believing, you just keep believing for God to be his God the same way that he is your God, amen? Are you with me? Amen? He is our avenger. The Lord says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. He is our deliverer. We are promised that in Isaiah 61, and then Jesus steps into it in Luke 4, that he has come to heal the brokenhearted, to bind up the wounded, to set the captive free. Amen? He is our deliverer. He is the God who just purchases what is needful for us, ransoms us, and he redeems us. He, it is the perfect picture of what was done at the cross. I love that old hymn, I know that my Redeemer lives. Amen? My Redeemer is alive. I know that he is. But listen, 
Verse 4 of Psalm 103 puts it this way. He redeems my life from the pit. I would venture to say that most of you who ever walked in this room walked in in the midst of some pretty pitiful situations, right? Some pretty <laughs> pitiful situations. He redeems our lives from the pit. Well, how do we even get in the pits? How do we even get in the pit? Okay, first thing I want to say to you is that Psalm 715, Psalm 715 speaks of one who falls into the pit that he has made. Oh, my word. Yeah, how many of, I've, of us have ever been there, right? A pit of our own making. Psalm 7, 15, and 16 says, He who digs a hole and scoops it out falls into the pit that he has made. Oh, my gosh. The trouble he causes recoils on himself. In other words, the way the world would put it these days, you can finish this. You made your bed. Yeah, exactly. How many of us have ever heard that, right? How many of us have ever heard that? Okay, so sometimes this is the truth. I mean, we have made our bed and we've made it badly. We have dug our own pit and we have fallen into it. And that is true. Isaiah 24, 17. Isaiah 24, 17 says... If you run from God, terror and a snare and a pit await you. That's pretty clear, don't you think? Don't you think that's pretty clear? Yeah. Jesus said in Matthew 15, 14, Jesus said in Matthew 15, 14, if the blind lead the blind, they both fall into a pit. Yeah, how many of you have ever been there? Yeah, I've been there. Yeah. Yeah, somebody's trying to help me and I'm trying to help somebody and we're both completely, totally off track, right? And we completely end up in the pit. We're together, of course, but we're in the pit together, right? You know, I was thinking about what you were saying, part of what I share with the Walls teaching. And uh, everything about help for hurting women is that misery loves company. Misery just wants to commiserate. It ju misery just wants to commiserate. Misery loves company, but misery yearns for comfort. Amen? And that's what Jesus brings. Well, when, when you're in this situation I'm talking about, and it's really described accurately in Psalm 40, verse 2. Psalm 40, verse 2. The psalmist says, he lifted me out of the slimy pit. He lifted me out of the slimy pit. <laughs> you know, and, and in Psalm 40, it doesn't really say exactly how this one got into the slimy pit. But when you're in the slimy pit, you pretty much know you're in it, right? You pretty much know you're in it. And Praise God. God says, here, it's a promise. He redeems your life from the pit. Glory to God. Okay, now, so sometimes it's a pit of our own making. Well, sometimes we are just distracted. Something has come and taken our attention away from the word, taken our attention away from the word from the Lord, from the path that he has for us to follow, we are just distracted. We're not really looking where we're going, and we're blindsided, right? It's called, a, uh, there is a word for this, it's called a pitfall. A pitfall. The definition is, it's something that's unforeseen. It's unexpected, a surprising difficulty, 
Something comes along. The truth of it is life happens. It does. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. Trouble happens. And if we are not prepared, we can easily become blindsided, distracted, and it's a pit fall. We are falling into the pit. But the truth of it is, sometimes we're pushed. And many of you in this room have experienced exactly that. You were ill-treated. You were treated unfairly. You were treated hurtfully. Trust was broken. People whom you should have been able to trust proved to be trustworthy. You were abused and misused and mistreated. You were pushed into the pit. And the truth of it is, it's dark there. No matter how you end up in the pit, it's dark there. It's lonely there. And there is only one who can truly help you to come out. Amen? His name is Jesus. And he is your redeemer. Amen? He will lift you out. He will wash you off. He will clean you up. And he will set you on solid ground. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. Turn with me to Psalm 40. Psalm 40, starting at verse 1. <clears throat> so I referred to verse 2 a little bit ago. We don't know how this one ended up in the pit. But we know once in the pit, Psalm 40, 1 through 5, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. Now let me pause there a moment. In every single one of our lives, when the enemy got us into a pit, he wanted us to give up there. He wanted us to become hopeless in that dark and slimy and lonely place, right? He want, that was his plan. You're going to hear fabulous promises here. Fabulous promises, but I don't want you to miss the first three words. I waited patiently, right? I waited patiently for the Lord. In other words, I did not give up. And he turned to me and he heard my cry. Verse two, he lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire, and he set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. You can say amen whenever you want. Hallelujah. He put a new song in my mouth. A hymn of, you know, is pretty much probably not a country and western song about losing everything. You know, it's probably pretty much not, right? He put a new song in my mouth. A hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. What? Many? Do you see that? He's bringing you out, and what's going to happen? Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Verse 5. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders that you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Can you say hallelujah? Hallelujah. There's a key in there for you. There's a key. If you're in a pit, even tonight, there's one way out. You need to praise him. You need to praise him. The last thing you will feel like do is praising him. That's the last thing that you will feel like doing. You have got to praise him on purpose. Well, Pastor Connie, I don't know one thing to praise him for. Well, praise God. You have your Bibles open to Psalm 103. Amen? All you have to do is open your mouth and pray your way through it. Right? It's there for you. Hallelujah. When you don't feel like it, God has already given it to you. Can you say amen? Amen. He redeems my life from the pit. 
And verse 4 in Psalm 103 continues, and crowns me with love and compassion. Part 4 tonight of this teaching is entitled, He Redeems and Crowns. He crowns me with love and compassion. Those of you who have pens or pencils, I want you to write this down because this is beautiful. The literal translation of the word there, crowns, means this, to encompass, E-N-C-O-M-P-A-S-S, encompass, to encircle, to surround, to enclose, and to envelop. Isn't that awesome? To crown literally means to encompass, to encircle, to surround, to enclose, to envelop. And it also means to crown, to cover for protection. To cover for protection. Every time that we are getting ready to go on a mission trip, I will bring myself, if I'm leading it, and the mission team down. We'll do this with our gals who are gonna go to Costa Rica, right? And we will bring them into the middle and we will gather around them and we will literally crown them, amen? We will cover them, we will encircle them, we will enclose them, we will envelop them, and we will pray for God's absolute protection. It's a beautiful picture a beautiful picture of what it is that God does for us. Can you say amen? amen? Amen. He crowns me. He crowns me with love. He crowns me with love. Now, this is a completely different idea because so often we think, well, God so loved the world and his love comes inside of me, right? His love comes inside of me and, and, and praise the Lord, God loves me. I'm coming to believe this now, that God actually loves me. You know, my testimony, my difficulty was, I believe God so loved the world, but then I be, had great difficulty believing that he still loved me because of the things that I had done and the way that I had lost my way. He crowns me with love. So I had come to know him personally and had come to believe that he loved me, but I had never considered that he encompassed me, encircled me, surrounded me, enclosed me, enveloped me, and protected me with his love. That's pretty awesome, don't you think? I mean, that's pretty awesome. You know, if we get a concept of this, what can the world possibly do to us? If we have that, if we are crowned in that way, if we are protected and covered in that way, 1 John 4, 16, if you have your Bibles, turn there. This is all the way in the back of your Bible, 1 John 4, 16. 1 John, this is not the Gospel of John. This is 1 John, also written by the Apostle John, the youngest of the disciples, 1 John 4, 16. So just, once you get there, just look at me for a moment. John, an amazing man. He was the youngest of the disciples, probably a, a mid-teen who loved Jesus, who was faithful to Jesus, who was part of Jesus' inner circle, P Peter, James, and John, the three who were the closest to Jesus, and it's quite amazing to me that on the cross, when Jesus was being crucified and his mother was there, knowing that Jesus had brothers, and all of tradition and all of history said that the care of his mother should have been given to the next older brother but they weren't there. The one who was there was John. The one who was there was John. And Jesus entrusted the care of his mother to John. 
we are told, history tells us, she was faithful. She was absolutely faithful. Faithful all the way until John went to Turkey and was planting churches. And, uh, and Mary was there. We'll to- we are told that Mary was there. Absolutely faithful, amazing woman of God. Faithful woman of God. John was not martyred. John lived until his 90s and died a natural death. It was amazing. And when he was in his 90s <laughs> on the Isle of Patmos, where they surely thought he would die, the prison island, that's where he had the revelation of Jesus. And that's where we get our book of Revelation. It's not Revelations. The book is Revelation because it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And John received it there. And afterward then, John wrote four books of the Bible that we have. Five books. He wrote the Gospel of John, which was probably the last that he wrote. He wrote the book of Revelation, and he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And it is amazing to me that this man who was the closest to Jesus, who was the youngest disciple, the one who lived the longest, the one who had Jesus appear to him in his 90s on the Isle of Patmos, is the one who wrote more about love than any other writer in the Bible. He wrote more about love than any other writer. Isn't that amazing? Most most people who know one sketch of a thing about Christianity know John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have eternal life. Amazing. But he wrote so much about love. I have my theory. Because he lived a life of love. He saw Jesus. He was with Jesus. Before, during the crucifixion, after the resurrection, he was baptized with the Holy Ghost. He served faithfully, continuously into his 90s. Jesus appears again. He knows this love. Amen? And in 1 John 4, 16, where I had you turn, in 1 John 4, 16, listen to this. Listen to what he writes. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. Can you say amen? Amen. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Can you say amen? I don't want it to escape you that this Friday is Valentine's Day. And some of you may already be preparing your pity party. You know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Listen, you have a lover beyond all lovers. There wasn't a man on the face of the earth who was more romantic than my husband, I am telling you. I mean, he was ridiculous about holidays like this. Ridiculous. He's gone. He's gone. But I am not forsaken. I am not forgotten. And I am not unloved because my maker is my husband. Amen. 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 And he is real to me. He is real to me. And I want this love to be so real to you. I know and I rely on the love that God has for me. God is love. And the truth of it is, no matter what it is that you've experienced, his love is pure. His love is not manipulative. 
His love has no agenda. His love never fails. It never fails. 1 Corinthians 13. Do you know how to find 1 Corinthians 13 in your Bible? Kind of in the middle of the New Testament, sort of. 1 Corinthians 13, starting at verse 4. And you see, this, this is one of the most familiar passages having to do with love. But I wanted you to see 1 John 4 first. 1 Corinthians 13, starting at verse 4. I wanted you to see 1 John first because... Multiple places, God says, John says, God is love. So when we are reading this passage of scripture, and it says love is patient, God is love. And that same word is used both places. God is agape, perfect love. God is agape. God, and so everywhere you read this here, you can substitute your God. Your God is patient. Love is kind. This love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. This love does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. Praise God, his love is not easily angered. Praise God, my God, my husband, my maker, my redeemer, his love keeps no record of wrongs. Can you say hallelujah? When we repent, it is wiped clean. He keeps no records of wrongs. Verse six, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And look at seven, this love, this God, always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And the next three words are love never fails. This is the only thing, ladies, in the entire Bible that we are told never fails. The agape love of God, the agape love of Jesus Christ never, never fails. It's stunning. It's absolutely amazing. So when this says that we are crowned with love, we are encompassed, we are encircled, we are surrounded, we are enclosed, we are enveloped, we are protected with his love. <laughs> we are protected with the only weapon that we have that we are told will never fail. His love will never fail. Amen? And that word pipto that is translated never fail says it will never cease to have power. Never in the name of Jesus. We are crowned with love and we are crowned with compassion. Crowned with compassion. Now, you know what we think about this word in English, the word compassion, and, and it literally means to be sympathetic in English, to be conscious of other people's distress and, and wanting them to have some kind of help. That's what compassion is in the English language. In the Old Testament, it, 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 the, the word really meant what, what a mother would feel when she was carrying a child and she began to feel the movement of that child inside of her that something would begin to stir inside of her that was a love that she really couldn't explain, but she knew that she felt it for this life that she is carrying. But when it came to Jesus, they literally, this, do you know in these days we make up words? Do you know there didn't used to be a word texted? <laughs> Text was something you read in your, in your book at school, right? There never used to be a word like texted, you know, or all kinds of words that are made up. But words have been made up every single year since the beginning of a time. And in Jesus' day, they literally, the New Testament writers, had to make up a new word. They make, and I'm not going to tell you the word because it's this long. It is a long word. But the Greek word means 
to have such a strong inner feeling concerning something or someone that you have to act on it. You have to do something. The feeling inside forces a response. That's why everywhere we read in the Gospels where it says Jesus was moved with compassion, so he healed. He was moved with compassion, so he fed them. He was moved with compassion, so he delivered them. You never ever read that it simply says Jesus was moved with compassion. Never. It is always connected to what he did because of his compassion. Are you with me? Are you with me? 2 Corinthians 5.14, you don't have to turn there, but 2 Corinthians 5.14, Paul said, for Christ's love compels us. His love, that love compels us toward compassion. So this scripture that I'm reading you tonight from verse 4 of 103 says, he redeems our lives from the pit and he crowns us with love and and compassion. Now just think about our theme scripture for class. 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4 for the entire ministry. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our trouble. Right? He's moved by our trouble. He's moved by our hurt. And as he is, because he's a God of compassion, what does he do? He brings comfort. He brings comfort to it, to us, if we will let him. And then that scripture goes on to say, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves have received from God. Can you say amen? He crowns us with love. He crowns us, he encircles us, he envelops us, he protects us with his compassion. And that compassion brings comfort to our hurt and to our trouble, but it doesn't end there. It, in, it doesn't end there. Why do you think these girls are going to Costa Rica? Why do you think? Because they want other women to receive exactly what they have received from God. Amen? Amen. It's exactly what God's plan is, the go of the gospel. God is sending us out to reach out and touch a love-starved world. The world doesn't know anything about this love. He's sending us out to touch a love-starved world with his compassion. And listen, this compassion has to flow to those who have been with God, have followed God. But you know what? They fell in a pit. Something happened. They fell in a pit. And someone has to care enough to be willing to be the one as they're calling for help, not even knowing what to do. Someone has to be the one who cares enough because of being crowned with love and compassion to extend that hand into the pit and say, I care about you. I will help you. Come on up, come out. And let's let God be God in your life. Amen? With every head down. Lord, you are so completely amazing. You encompass us, encircle us, surround us, enclose us, envelop us, protect us with your love and with your compassion. We are crowned. Crowned. But it says crowns. You continue to crown us. You continue this work. And it's absolutely incredible. But what we're talking about here is an outside, over us work. 
but I don't know where you are on the inside. I don't know if you have allowed this loving Jesus Christ to come in and be your Savior and be your Lord and minister to your spirit. So if you have not made this decision for yourself, this is precisely why you're sitting in here tonight. Exactly. Because it, it could all be over. We sang it this weekend in church. <laughs> the midnight cry, right? It could be any moment. Any moment. But for now, you have life. For now, you have this moment. And you have this opportunity to accept Jesus as your Savior to make him Lord over every part of your life. Maybe you've never done this before, or maybe just like me, you did it, but you lost your way. And you know it's time. It's time with all of your heart. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all my inmost being. Jesus, I bless you, and I love you, and I need you as my savior. If that is you, would you just raise your hand so I can pray for you? Anyone, anyone in here, you need to accept Jesus? Go ahead, honey, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Sharon's gonna come right over and stand by you, praise God. Anybody else in here? You need to accept Jesus tonight as your savior or you need to wholeheartedly rededicate your life to him? Praise God. Praise God. Most wonderful decision you've ever made in your life. Would you all just pray as I lead you in a prayer? Pray out loud. Hear yourself praying out loud. Dear Heavenly Father, I need help. I need you, Jesus. And I thank you that you sent Jesus just for me to bring me up out of the pit, to put me on solid ground, to wash me off, clean me up, robe me in your love, and give me a new life. Thank you, Jesus. I accept you as my Savior, as my Lord of every part of my life. I ask you to forgive me for every way that I failed you. Wash me clean. Thank you for your cleansing, for your love, and for your life. And I thank you that you are the God who forgives me, who heals me, <laughs> who crowns me with love, and compassion in Jesus name amen? amen amen give him praise come on give him praise give him praise hallelujah nothing better than that glory to God Heavenly Father I pray for every woman in this room and all those in the sound of my voice and God as we go from this time and we go from this place I just ask you that your word will just resonate in our hearts just do what you are longing to do. Lord, let the root of this go deep, but let us see ourselves. Lord, you are the one who crowns us with your love and with your compassion. Lord, let us believe it, let us receive it, and let us live it, and let us give it. And we will thank you for it. Now take us home, Lord, to our places of rest safely huge angels on guard round about us and we will give you glory and honor and praise for it in jesus name and all god's women said amen, amen. come on give him praise come on give him praise give him praise hallelujah glory to god